Good morning, church. Good to be with you. Always a joy and a privilege. In John chapter 1, verse 46, please go ahead and turn to John chapter 1. Verse 46, Nathanael said to Philip, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Philip replied, said to him, come and see. That phrase, come and see, becomes in the Bible one of those overarching messages that can epitomize the entire message of God to mankind. The Bible, in a very real sense, is God's way of seeing or saying, if you're curious about life, if you're curious about re the reality that you live within, come and see. I've revealed it all. Notice beginning in verse 35 of John chapter 1. Again the next day, John stood with two of disciples, this is John the Immerser, and looking at Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold the man. Disciples and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned and seeing something said to them, What do you seek? They said to him, Rabbi, which is to say when translated teacher, where are you staying? Understand, they have called him teacher. They are Disciples of John looking to become disciples of his. When they say, where are you staying? They're not just curious about his lodging. Okay? They're asking much, much more. What was Jesus' response? And he said to them, come and see. They came and saw where he was staying and remained with him that day. Now it was about the tenth hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon, and he said to him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Why? So that Peter could come and see. We found the Messiah. Peter didn't say, Okay, great. Talk to you later. You can guess what his response was. Really? Come and see. Now Jesus, when Jesus looked at him, he said, You are Simon, the son of Jonah. You shall be called Cephas, which is translated a stone. And the following day, Jesus wanted to go to Galilee, and he found Philip and said to him, Follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and, and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, See, three times in that little passage. One, it's not said, but it's certainly implied and was said, Come and see. The Messiah has come. Has he? Come and see. Brethren, that phrase is a challenge to everyone to come and see the truth of our existence. Again, the Bible speaks of God, tells us of his nature, tells us of our reality that, that we are in this flesh in order to make a choice, tells us of the problem we have with sin, tells us of how His Son came into the world to offer us that way of overcoming sin, that we might be with Him forever in heaven. But you've got to look into it. Everyone must come and see. This morning, we're going to talk about come and see in three aspects. The fact that we have to prove the truth. We have to live the truth. And we have to offer the truth. To prove it. There's the challenge. Look what Jesus himself said in Matthew 7, 7 through 8. Toward the end of the Sermon on the Mount. He's already told us of the heart that is required in order to be one of his people. He's then spent uh, the end of chapter 5 and all of chapter 6 talking about the natural expression of that heart. And then in chapter 7... He's going to warn them about false teachers ultimately. But here, look what he says. He said, ask and it will be given to you. Seek 
and you will find. Knock, and it will be open to you. For everyone who asks, receives. And he who seeks, finds. And to him who knocks, it will be open. Brethren, the theme of the Sermon on the Mount is the kingdom. It's all about the kingdom. The heart required. The actions of. Jesus said we must ask, seek, and knock for the kingdom. That promised kingdom which for us, the church, and ultimately heaven. Notice the progressive nature. Ask. Then seek. Then knock on the door to get entrance. We must do the same with this word that God has given to us. The purpose of religion, literally the word religion means to bind together again. It's talking about the separation that happened in the garden. Man was separated from God because of our sin. Religion is the means by which we reattach ourselves to him. We access his grace by faith, right? That's religion. We need to look into that. Religions have to tell us where we came from, why we're here, what happens when we die, what should we be doing while we're here. And we must investigate it. Because there are lots of answers out there. Just step back sometime and consider all the so-called religions and philosophies that exist in this world. Which one's true? Again, we have to use our brains. I have a, one of my teachers made that statement and it becomes so powerful. God gave us the Bible and he gave us a brain. He expects us to use both of them not one or the other. So we need to look into it to prove it. Well, the Bible, I believe it is the truth. Well, that's wonderful. But this person over here believes something else, and this person over here believes something else. And logic says we can all be wrong, but we can't all be right. Right? A and not A cannot both be true. (laughs) One has to be true, or both can be false. We've got to put in the labor to find out. We have to come and see. When I was in college many, many moons ago, long before I was man enough to become a Christian, I looked into religions. I was curious. Here I found myself on this ball of dirt under the sun. What's that about? People say you should live this way. Some people say you should live this way. Well, what is it? So I looked into many religions, not all of them. And even that precursory look showed me the foolishness of so much that's called religion. And I came to the conclusion that Christianity was true. Why? Because of the things it says. It says an immortal and spiritual God created a physical and finite universe. And that works. That's the law of causation, right? It shows mankind through the pages here, and it's us. When you read these pages, it speaks of us. So many other religions, they, you think of the mythology of the Greeks and Romans, and it's just, that's not us. You read this book, and that's us. Think of that wonderful preacher of righteousness, Noah, who saved his family and and saved all those animals and built that ark and he did all that goodness preserving mankind and he got off the boat and he planted a vineyard and he got drunk and naked. And you're like, that's us. Right? That's us. Oh, here was great Abraham, the father of faith and he got afraid so he lied and yeah, that's us. It talks about how we should be and it gives us this character Jesus who says, This is how we should be. And I used to make this foolish statement. I thought I was so clever. I thought I was being so benevolent. And I would say, even if there is no God, I would be proud to die a Christian. Doesn't that sound noble? It's ridiculous. Because if there is no God, then it was all a waste of time. Okay? But even a precursory look, you can see the truth. And brethren... All people must do this. 
every single person must look into it. And once you've looked into it and you've come to the, the conclusion that the Bible, it is indeed inspired of God and inerrant, you must prove it to yourself, to your satisfaction. Notice in the beginning of that passage, John 1, verse 35, these two disciples were told by John, their master, that Jesus was the Christ. But what did they do? They went and checked it out, didn't they? So too we. Faith of our fathers, amen. But that faith must eventually become faith of our fathers that we have looked into and we have come to believe. Now it is our faith. Because we can't live on other people's faith. And if our faith is challenged by the circumstances of life, by those who would attack God and, and Christ, we must be able to defend it with more than, well, my daddy said so when I believe it. Well, I appreciate that. But there's lots of daddies in the world saying lots of things that aren't necessarily true. We must prove the truth to ourselves. Is it inspired of God? Yes. Look into it. Is this book without error? Yes. Look into it. Prove it. Because they say there are so many errors in it. Well, where are they? Have you looked into it? Have you seen the refutation of those supposed errors? You need to, so that you can not only defend your own faith and claim it as your own, but you may help others. Okay? Um, did this come from God? Do we have exactly what God wanted us to have? All of it? None lacking. Brother Keith had asked that question about where, does this, where did this Bible come from? How do we know that this book is the one from God and that there isn't one missing, as false teachers often say, or that there wasn't stuff added that shouldn't be there, as some people say? You've got to look into it. I have been hired here at the assembly here to help you with these things, brethren. I have offered myself to you to study with you pretty much any time you'd like, but, you know, come on. Um, but just ask me. And if you don't want that, I can refer you to the resources. You want to know that this Bible that we have is from God? Well, Denny Petrillo has an eight-hour video. If you want to go deeper than you ever wanted to go into source criticism, he has it for you. A member of the church piled high and deep, Ph.D., and he will go there. If you're not looking to go that deep, Neil Lightfoot wrote a fantastic book called How We Got the English Bible. And there it is, and it answers your questions. We must look into it. We must have the answers so that we can at least refer other people. Here is the truth, and I love it, but we must verify it. Faith is not a blind trust. What does the Bible tell us faith is? Faith is, It is the substance. It is evidentiary. We have proofs of it. Look into it. The next logical step with come and see. Is this the truth? Is there a God? Is Jesus the Son of God? Is he Lord in Christ? Come and see. The next logical step after looking into it is living it. We're going to look at four verses. Well, there, there are some passages mixed in. And I want to notice how that idea of proving it is in the living of it as well. Not only we must prove to ourselves that it is indeed from God, that it is inherent, that it is true, we must then prove it by living it. Romans 12, verse 2. The Apostle Paul wrote, and do not be conformed to this world. I know that statement, Rick. Brethren, friends, it is so hard not to conform yourself to this world within which we live. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. To what purpose? That you may prove. What is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God? Here is the mind of Christ we're supposed to make our own. And if we live it, we 
prove it not only to ourselves, but to the whole world that this is indeed the truth. Do you remember what Moses wrote in Deuteronomy when he was talking about the fact that all the nations around Israel were going to say, what nation is like Israel? What nation has such incredible laws and justice and mercy? Who is like them? Here's the only problem. Israel didn't live up to that. And so the word of God was blasphemed instead of proven to the whole world. They were supposed to be a shining light in the midst of empires. Just like we're supposed to be shining light. 1 Thessalonians 4 verses 11 through 12. The Apostle Paul wrote that Christians, that we are to aspire to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, to work with your own hands as we have commanded you. Why are we to do those things? The context of that is, what's the will of God for us, church? Sanctification. Making us special, holy, set apart, different. For what purpose? That you may walk properly toward those who are outside, and that you may lack nothing. In Ephesians 5, we're still studying Ephesians. It's been, what, 14 years? But we're getting pretty close. We're in chapter 6 now. But Ephesians 5, 8 through 10. For you, Christians, you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk, live your lives as children of light, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. That word finding out is actually translated proving in the King James, in the American Standard, and in the Revised Version. It's the same word in Romans 12, 2, translated prove. You're supposed to prove what is acceptable to the Lord, to yourself and to the world. What does it mean to prove? All right, Rick, I'm, I'm giving you a bow and arrow for a present. Here you go. Thank you. How do I prove it? I'm going to use it. I'm going to knock the arrow. I'm going to aim. I'm going to pull. I'm going to shoot probably going to pull my name, and, and then shoot. It snaps in my hands. Thanks for the gift. If it works, I've proved it. It's tried and true, right? So too here. Later in verse 17 of that same chapter, he says, summing up, therefore do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. The word there means to join together. Join what together, do you think? What you know and how you walk. Don't be foolish knowing this and acting some other way. Know and live it. That's our challenge. Because not too much, probably, those of you who have been Christians for many, many moons, probably not too much that is set up here is new to you. But here's the challenge. Why is the preacher always going on about things? Because the living of it is the proof and the hardest part of the doing. James chapter 2, it is by works that faith is completed. Oh, I believe that uh, there's a huge heavy weight getting ready to fall on my head. But it's proven and perfected when I get out of the way. If you tell me there's a huge weight getting ready to fall on my head and I don't move, did I really believe you? Or am I just, you know, a three-way bulb permanently set on dim? I'm not getting it. It's one thing to understand the Bible's teaching on marriage. How a husband is to treat his wife. How a wife is to treat her husband. It is quite another thing to actually do it. And to actually have that godly marriage. It is one thing to understand that the Bible says we are to raise our children up, bring them up, literally nourish them, in the training and admonition of the Lord. It is quite another thing to actually do it. Because we're in the world. And the world disagrees with regards to marriage with God. The world disagrees with God with regards to raising children. Dr. Spock, those of you who are old enough 
I don't mean this guy, I mean the other guy, who had no children, said that corporal punishment was wrong. It was even evil. And yet the Bible says it is good and profitable. Spare the rod, spoil the child. Foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. What's going to remove it? A timeout? No. The rod of correction will drive it far from them. Who are you going to listen to? Church? Are we going to listen to Dr. Spock and our culture? Or are we going to actually do what God said? Training up our children in the admonition of the Lord. Now, brief aside. Children are different. Each one of my children were different. One child, the oldest, I don't know if I ever spanked her one time because I could just look at her and she would be reduced into a, a blubbering, crying mess. We've talked about Deirdre though, right? Yeah, so they're different. Um, and Susie was just perfect and never needed correction, so I'm trying to be nice to her. Um, but there's God's way of raising children and then there's the world's. Who are we going to listen to? Because, you see, if we profess to be Christians, but we're living according to the world's ways, we're not proving it. We're blaspheming it. And brethren, it's not easy, but we must stand to do the things that God said, to speak when we should speak. And it's a challenge, but here's the problem. Not only will you blaspheme God, not only will you fall short if you don't prove the word of God by knowing and by living it consistently more and more as time goes by, but our evangelism, that outreach, you understand that if we're not living the word, we're not shining that word with our lives. We're supposed to offer it. Jesus said, Matthew 5, 13 through 16. Again, you've probably heard this before, right? He said, you are the salt of the earth. Salt gives flavor. Salt preserves. What does salt do in a, in a wound? It hurts as it heals. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor... How shall it be seasoned? How are you going to make salt salty? Are you going to add salt to it? <laughs> if the salt's lost its seasoning, it does no good. It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. Brethren, what are Christians who don't shine as light? They are good for nothing. It's not my words, but his because Jesus said, we are the light of the world. A city set upon a hill, it cannot be hidden. Our lives should not be able to be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Here's the command, brethren, from our Lord and Savior. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Sometimes our struggles in evangelism, I am afraid, is not because the world has no interest. It's because we look no different. If we're just a variation on a theme, well, who cares? It's Baskin Robbins theology. Choose your flavor. It doesn't matter. We're supposed to shine and stand out and be different, right? 1 Peter 3.15, people are supposed to attack us. To this you have been called because of our difference. And we're supposed to be ready to give a defense and explain why we're different. Brethren, what if we're not different? Then they'll never ask. And we won't be effective in our outreach. Well, how are we to be different? by not only knowing this book, but living it, proclaiming it, 
speaking it, even when it's not popular, right? 2 Timothy chapter 4, preach the word when? When there's a receptive audience that wants to hear it. Otherwise, you probably should not talk about Jesus. No. In season and out of season. Always. But they might get mad at me. There it is. That's the light doing the work. There's your opportunity to speak. But what if they don't like it? What if they'll pick up rocks? You can shoot arrows at a city set upon a hill. What did Jesus do? We're supposed to follow him. Offering the truth to people begins, it's inside out. It begins with our life, showing that there's a difference. Compassion in an uncompassionate world. Forgiving in an unforgiving world. Reprimanding in a world that says, oh, it doesn't matter. If it feels good, do it. All that matters is consent. That's not true. The Word of God matters. Well, this is just a lifestyle we have chosen, and there's nothing wrong with it. Says who? The Bible says it's very clear. And we're supposed to love all people. What did Jesus do? Did he speak up when it wasn't popular to speak up? Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. You sweethearts. No. Hypocrites. This, these are the people in charge, Jesus. You mess with them, you might get in trouble. Yeah. How did he respond to that? On the cross. Forgive them. It's my will, Father. If I could have my way, I would have them all be forgiven. And I'm giving my life for their forgiveness. Wow. That hard. Come and see. Is this the word of God, church? Have you come and seen? As Peter did, did you come and see? Are you able to defend it? to those around you, to the ones you love most? Does your marriage reflect God's plan and purpose? Or does it reflect the world? Does your rearing of your children reflect God's will and purpose? Or is this how the world does it now? God has a plan. He's told us how to be. Man, woman, parent, child. The question is, will we take his standard and live according to his plan, his pattern? Or will we conform ourselves to the world within which we find ourselves? There's the struggle. There's the test of your belief in this word. Because he has said, if you do this, this will be the result. Do you believe it? Then so live. Finally. Whoa. I'd already done that. Sorry. Finally. Therefore, I wrote a sermon a long time ago, one of my first ones ever. Um, our lives, Christianity, brethren, friends, is walking alone together. No matter how much I love my wife, I cannot answer for her at judgment, and I cannot live her life for her. I can only answer for me. I can only control me. I think it's a mistake in God's plan. I think if I could control everybody, it'd be a much better place. Said every dictator and tyrant ever, yes, <laughs> exactly. No, I can only control me. I can only be, the, I'm the only one that's going to answer when God says, um, I gave you a wife, how did you treat her? I gave you children, how did you raise them? I gave people in your, in your life and around you, and how did you influence them? What did you do with my son? I gave you him. I can't say, um, on my behalf, I'd like to refer to Brother Ben to speak for me. I give him my five minutes. And then Ben speak. No. We walk alone, church. But here's the beautiful thing. We're not alone. I love my wife. My wife loves me. 
and we walk alone, but we do it together. And when Rick starts not doing a job real well, my wife places her foot where it needs to be. And I appreciate it. And I would do the same for her, but of course, she is without fault. So no such thing. We walk together. Now I have children. The children are getting older. And we walk together. We have the church. And though we answer individually, we help one another by giving examples, encouragement, rebuke and reproof sometimes, and comfort. And those who have gone on before, that great cloud of witnesses, oh, how they help us too and call us home. Jesus said to his disciples, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. How do you make a disciple, Jesus? Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. That word go would be better translated and as you are going. He's not commanding that you've got to get up and go. He's saying, as you're about, as you're going, do this. That's why it can be applicable to us. As we're about our life, make disciples. How? Gain the world's attention by your holy, sanctified living. And then be able to give an answer for that hope which lies within you. That's his will. The question is, what is yours? If you're not a Christian this morning, God calls to you. He loves you. He sets you free. You've engaged in sin, those things contrary to his will, but he is rich in mercy. And he offers the blood of his son to wash you clean. Why not this morning? Christians, be conformed to the world. There is a way that seems right to man, but the end of that is death. Proverbs 14 and 12. Jeremiah 10, 23. I know it is not in man to seek out his own way. God has told us the way we are to live, the way we are to be husband, wife, parent, child, brethren, fellow citizen. The question is, will you do it? If you haven't been doing it, consider. Come and see what God has offered. If there's anything we can do to help you, we'd ask that you come as together we stand and sing.